This is Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top questions and struggles. I share what to eat, how to move, and to think to get the energy and the vitality you want in this second and better half. And my guest today is going to shed some light on just how better we can get it. Dr. Heidi Forbes Esta, digital well-being and ethics evangelist. Just flip 50, by the way, in September of 18. Dr. Heidi Forbes Esta is a behavioral scientist, best-selling author of Digital Self Mastery series, and executive producer of the Evolving Digital Self podcast. She combines 25 years experience in social strategy consulting with her scholarly research in the human relationship with technology and her personal passion for well-being. Her being at work research revealed innovative solutions for presenteeism, well-being tech development and integration and user experience designed related to the contemporary workplace. She holds several advisory roles as an expert on digital well-being and ethics for new technologies to support the transition into the digital era without losing humanity in the process. She connects organizations with innovative digital well-being strategy to match their employees and customers' evolving needs and innovators with insight into human and organization behavior that impact their solutions' ability to succeed. A scholar, practitioner, connector, and global citizen, Heidi lives by the motto, knowledge is power, sharing is powerful. Heidi, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Deborah. Well, I think we have to add this one little tidbit here. So as a flipping 50-year-old, Heidi, you've managed to battle debilitating depression caused by seasonal affective disorder, something as we record that could be a common problem for listeners while you were living in Sweden and you continue to fight the battle with Lyme and Hashimoto hyperthyroid and yes, hormone roller coaster of perimenopause. Absolutely. (laughs) My listeners all just embrace you virtually. (laughs) Thank you. So she's like us. I think we can we can say that to the least. I can't wait to unpack this. You know, I think uh, there's probably not not a listener out there who's not sitting in front of a screen a lot of their day today. So let's talk about this. I mean, living well with technology. How do we do it? You know, how do we learn to thrive with autoimmune disease? You know, while using tech. Because a lot of our listeners do also, they're in that boat with you with Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. Talk to me a little bit about where we even start. I feel like I'm overwhelmed with even the topic. Yeah, so, yeah, there's, so there's, there's a lot of different angles that we could come at from this. But I think it's important to recognize two different things. One is, what is your relationship with technology? And what kind of system have you created to really make sure that your you know, building a harmonious tech system that supports you rather than becomes disruptive. And so a lot of my work is really, and and the digital self piece is really helping people understand sort of what is their type of profile and what kinds of tools are they matching with that profile and learning to evolve with the technology so that it supports you. Um, And the other piece is, you know, really understanding um, the tools that could potentially support whatever challenges you have. So um, as you mentioned, my being at work research really came out of when I was doing my doctoral studies, I came down, I first had the seasonal affective disorder while we were living in Sweden. And I was just completely checked out from uh, depression. And it had gotten worse and worse every year. We were there for seven and a half years And um, I finally got to this place where, you know, I was just basically couch bound and I I couldn't understand what was happening because I, prior to that, had been a very athletic, healthy, connected person. When I'm on, I'm feeling great. I'm sort of the one that's leading the social conversation and trying to get people together. and, And it was just a complete shutdown. And I ended up using some wearable technologies 
to um, that were actually at the time synced with my dog so that if I didn't respond, my dog responded and, and then got me sort of up off the couch and made sure that I moved around and things like that. Um, and that sort of spurred the curiosity for me of how can we use these tools in a way to support us when we're not able to support ourselves, that we can create that presence that is, you know, that is really the most important way that we can connect with the world and with our work and, and with our just ability to thrive. So, um, so I ended up doing my research around that and, um, picked 10 different devices from that were completely across the board and different targeting different, uh, chronic conditions to, um, to see if that would actually create a shift in our ability to be fully focused and present. So, you know, sort of there's two different sides to it. One is setting up a system and setting up an environment that's supportive of us and recognizing those things that aren't helping us. And the other piece is really seeking out the tools that will help us help support us where we need a little bit of extra help. Wow, I love that. So really, we kind of entered this from one side, you raise a question. I mean, really is, is technology working for us or against us? And what I love is I actually found my shoulders kind of sinking away from my ears when you were first talking, because you are about putting me, right, or any listener back in control. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And right now, I think we all feel like we're out of control. Like there's technology all around us and we don't necessarily love it. <laughs> well, and that's and that's part of the thing is that you've got to gre- create a space where you can love it. You can that that you it supports you and makes you feel stronger rather than weaker. And 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 there are so many options now. And it's really important to sort of step back. I mean, kind of like, I'm sure your listeners are probably familiar with the the classic, you know, elimination diet, where you like, go back to absolute core basics, to figure out what kinds of things are, are toxic for you that are causing problems for you. And you kind of need to do that also with technology. And, you know, a full elimination or, you know, removing technology from your life is pretty, is virtually impossible these days to be able to still function in in work and and, and life. And so it's kind of, you know, unrealistic to think that we're just going to remove it all. But we can actually pare things down to an absolute baseline, and then slowly add things in to identify what things are actually causing triggers, what things are causing a toxic, toxic response, and then figuring out whether one, do we need them? And if we do need them, can we find another way or another tool that can accomplish what that's supposed to accomplish? Or is it something we can delegate? Um, and then the others are what things are, you know, do help us and do support us. Um, and then also just clearing out all of the excess. And we need to actually really do this kind of like a spring cleaning on a regular basis. And that's everything from removing all the extra apps on your phone to, um, you know, and your computer so that it runs smoothly and you run smoothly um, to simple things of like, turning your phone fully off once a week and your computer and everything else, turning it fully off and giving it a chance to reboot and giving you a chance to reboot. So, and and that can be at overnight, but it's just turn it fully off and everything functions better when it's had a chance to, you know, upload all of the new operating systems and just sort of do all of its checks and balances when it reloads, and we all have a chance to do that, of getting perspective, coming away, and then and then coming back into things, we have a, a better opportunity to really see clearly what's going on. So good. It's such a great analogy. So anybody listening here, so many of my listeners have done a Flipping 50 program. And those of you who don't have any idea what she's talking about, the 28-day kickstart, this was a perfect infomercial, thanks to Heidi. For exactly what she's describing, those of you listening who've gone through it, she just made the perfect analogy to 
why we do that first week, the way we do it as far as exercise goes, why we're removing those foods to bring them back one by one. And I love this idea of the reboot. So good. So good. Okay. I want to, before we get too far away from this, because you really had my attention when we were talking a little bit more about wearable technology and your um, thesis. So wearable technology, coincidentally, or not so much, you know, it's been on the top 20 list, and it's been in the top five for a few years with fitness trends. So just two weeks ago, as we record, the 2019 fitness trends came out and number one is wearable fitness technology. So I've got questions on this. You know, is there a good side, bad side to wearing fitness technology? Uh, I, you know, I, I personally, and of course, I'm biased because I think uh, technology, as long as you find the right technology for you, is a good thing. Um, so because there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with knowing better what's going on in their system. You know, for example, when you go to a doctor and they say, how are you feeling? You say, I'm feeling fine. You know, that's not very helpful to them in terms of understanding or, you know, you know, are you extra, are you exercising? Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm exercising a lot. Well, for one person exercising a lot, maybe the, that they, you know, recently ran a marathon for another person, it may be that they walk around the block, rock around the block every day that week. And they're like, yep, okay, I did my exercise. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to, to be able to use these tools to communicate with our healthcare practitioners, with our support teams, whether it's working with someone like you or, you know, or whether it's working with, um, you know, a dietitian or whatever it is, it's important to, to be able to really think beyond what we consciously are aware of. And, um, wearables are great in that regard because they can do it passively. Um, so you're not necessarily having to take your heart rate regularly, but it's catching it. Um, so, and it also helps when, you know, to identify when there are certain irregularities of things that maybe you need to be putting more focus on and you may not have noticed because we are all pretty busy. So we just, you know, we don't notice when we get these stress spikes and, and, or we don't notice necessarily what's going on with our sleep, but we feel tired or, things like that. So I think wearables can be really, really helpful in that regard, but also beyond sort of the fitness wearables. Um, you know, in my study, we used, you know, posture correction wearables, we used wearables, actually, the one that women always remember, or actually, men wear, remember it too, is in, in the study, we had um, some other participants using a wearable vibrator that um, was to stimulate their oxytocin because they were suffering from hormone related depression. So that's not a fitness wearable, but it is still something it's using technology to stimulate neurotransmitters that are absolutely necessary for us to thrive. So, you know, it's all about connecting the body and the mind. And really sometimes we lose contact with our body to really yeah. understand what's going on. Yeah, not to interrupt, but I'm just thinking everybody listening may be distracted. So I want to get them off of this distraction. So did you just tell listeners to have more orgasms for oxytocin? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify, and I'm so glad. And listeners, go for that. Okay. <laughs> is there is there a negative to so checking in, taking a snapshot? Is there any negative to having electronics on all the time? I mean, what, what's your take on that? Well, so there's a couple different things to take into consideration here. One, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're strapping devices all over you all the time, um, <laughs> that's probably not great for your Only body. the vibrator. <laughs> yeah, only the vibrator, right. Uh, <laughs> you know, too much of anything is really never good. But I think the other thing is it's very individualized and, and, you know, we're all so unique. And my whole premise of everything that I write and I speak about is that the anomaly is the norm and you need to learn what works for you. Something that, you know, I am, I work in an Apple ecosystem. I love my Apple watch. It's actually saved my, my life three times, you know, it, it literally saved my life three times. And, but that's what works for me. That may not work for somebody else. So 
it's it's important to sort of figure out what tools work for you and also what your sensitivity is to. Some of your listeners may be familiar with the term EMFs, which is electromagnetic frequencies. Some people are much more sensitive to those. And mm. so they really have more of a toxic response to technology. So you want to be very careful about how much technology you're putting around you when you are sensitive. But there are ways that you can counter that as well. So it's also looking at the different tools that you can use to minimize the EMFs. And so I think there's, you know, again, it's the anomaly is the norm. It's important to really learn what works for you and identify the things that may be having a toxic response. Um, But regardless of what you choose, your sleep is sacred and you should have the minimal amount of technology near your sleeping space. Um, So I advise all of my clients, I don't care what kind of anomaly you are, that you should have a docking station away from your bedroom where all of your technology is, you know, it's ready to go in the morning because it's been charging. And the only exception to that would be something that's a sleep tracker. And I use my Apple Watch, I turn it into nightstand mode so it doesn't actually send me any signals. It just functions purely as a watch when it's in nightstand mode, but then it's charging. So, you know, I tr- I really try to try to keep the technology outside of the bedroom. And I think that that is really the only place that for absolutely everyone, no matter what your profile is, um, is highly recommended. And if you can't resist having it in your bedroom or not having it in your bedroom, um, you need to use blue blocker lenses when you're watching something on the screen in the, in the night. Otherwise, it does disrupt your circadian rhythms. Great. So what about those of us who are in front of a computer, just uh, what seems like 24 seven? So let's say 12, 12 out of 12 out of 24 hours. Should we be wearing those blue blocker lenses? Absolutely. And the the cool thing is there's so many different varieties now. I mean, um, I have several different pairs. I have one that I wear at conferences. They're super geeky, but they actually work really well. And because of the topic that I work with it's okay for me to have super geeky glasses, uh, but they're very yellow lenses. But the the reason I wear those is because of the indoor lighting. It's not just the screens, but the indoor yes. lighting. Um, I find I, I end up getting really bad headaches. I do too. Yeah. So and you know on planes and things like that, it's just that that kind of lighting really is disturbing to me, almost more than the blue light. Um, so really, again, it's the individual. How sensitive are to it? Are you to it? And I would really test a couple different versions. I have a pair that I wear when I'm just at home and I'm going to be watching TV or something, and they're they're not nearly as sort of bright yellow. Or my son actually has sort of three different colors that he uses. He's he's become sort of possessed with it and and does a lot of research on it. Um, so he's been you know, looking into all different kinds. And he was the one that actually my 17 year old son was the one that insisted because of the amount of time that I'm in front of the screen, that I should be wearing blue blocker lenses. So um, of course, the more I learned about it, the more I realized, oh, my goodness, I should have been wearing these a long time ago. (laughs) So talk, talk to us about so you have been wearing them. Talk to us about what have you noticed? I mean, do you have fewer or, you know, less frequent headaches, less severe? What's, what's been the change? I have not had any headaches since I, and, and oh I my mean, God. yeah, I'm getting some right now. Yeah. So, um, I really, you know, for me, the other piece is, um, you know, when I'm at conferences, I don't get the headaches from the conferences. My stress level is lower. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think really the the key thing for me is the the headaches. I just you know I'm not the and I ended up having to get my challenge was I wear readers, and um, you know the sort of swapping back and forth was kind of a pain. But I ended up getting another pair that I can just pop over my readers if I need to, um, because most of the time I don't need a, my you know my readers to look at the screen because it's further away from me. But if I'm on my iPhone and I know that I'm going to be traveling a lot and I'm going to be looking at my phone a lot. I find the readers are really great. The the reader cover ones are great. So I'm in the opposite boat. So I actually need my glasses to see the screen. So 
I'm assuming I could probably find something to put over those. There are so many options now. And I'm, you know, I would just research it to find one style that you like, because if you don't like the style, you're not going to wear them. So it doesn't matter. Um, and, and I think that's really another thing that I work with with my clients on when I'm advising on digital well-being and ethics. Part of it is just helping you think about design that, you know, you may have the greatest technology or the greatest tools in the world, but if people don't use them, they're, they're never going to get the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. So, you know, it has to be something that works well with people in their existing lifestyle. Um, and so, you know, pick glasses that you will, that you will wear style wise and find the right lenses and I believe you can probably, even at your local optometrist, if you wear prescription lenses, you can probably get uh, Blue Block or, you know, computer glass filters on uh, on a prescription lens. I just, I haven't looked at it myself, but I can't imagine with all of the options that are out there now that you can't get a prescription with the Blue Blockers. So good. And I had never thought of it for for that reason. So going to a conference or even on an airplane, but oh my gosh, I'm all over that. So that brings me to this next question. So that's a problem I hadn't identified with what was going on. So are there other problems caused by tech that we may not even attribute it to? And how do we identify those? Problems related to tech? Well, you know, Again, you know, I'm I'm an optimist when it comes to technology. So it's, yeah. it's more, you know, I, I don't necessarily look at anything like a, as a problem. It's more a challenge and things that you can overcome. But I think um, one of the things that a lot of my clients struggle with is um, is filtering the noise. So mm. and and I I mean that both by the um, the physical noise and also just the um, mm -hmm. you know. The, the virtual noise, whether that's in their notifications, their email, they're just trying to, you know, whether it's, you know, when you turn on your TV and there's just too many channels, too many options, and and half of it, it you're not really sure if you can understand it or believe it or want to hear it, or some of it is just so negative that it it causes stressful responses. And and I think what's important to remember with with um, these kinds of things is that it's not the technology that's the problem. It's, you know, technology is neutral and it's how we're using the technology. It's how we're, you know, how we're choosing to engage with the technology. Um, and same with, you know, the way that it's created. So there's people on either end and you have the power to go in and say, I'm going to turn this off. And you have to take that power back. You have to take that power back in, um, you know, going into your notifications, just like that elimination diet, going through, going into your phone or going into your computer and turning all the notifications off first, and then slowly adding in the ones that you absolutely need and nothing else because you, it, it causes a cortisol response every time you get a notification. And whether it's and, and for for some of us who are introverts, it's just the cortisol response. For others who are extroverts and want to engage with the world, they're waiting for that dopamine and serotonin kick of I got a notification, somebody liked me, somebody likes this. It's gonna they're gonna fast pass it on. But it's causing a neurological neurological response every single time. And mm you need to, you know, to build in that awareness of what is that response and what is that actually, how is that impacting everything else? Is it, you know, taking you down another rabbit hole of, oh my God, I got a notification for this. I better go look at that and respond to it. And then, you know, an hour goes away and you realize you haven't done the thing that you were really supposed to do and focus on your high value actions. Or is it something that is absolutely critical and thank goodness you responded to that? Um, so I think, you know, again, it's building an awareness for ourselves, but, you know, cr it, empowering ourselves to be in control of that is really, really important. Love that. Back to the control. I can't get too much of that in today's world. So we've got a question. I mean, given, given you've got personal experience dealing with Hashimoto's and mm -hmm. technology and kind of bonding and, and maneuvering your way through that, a lot of our listeners 
may have thyroiditis and or Hashimoto's and some others, many more struggle with adrenal fatigue as they're going through this menopause transition. What suggestions specifically, um, and maybe that spills over to all of us, but probably you've got a color in the line inside the lines a little bit more. If you've got something going on, how can they specifically take good care of themselves if they're working with tech regularly? Yeah. So there's a, there's a couple different things. Um, and I think, you know, one is sort of, again, it's, it's using them for, for the good side of them, um, or recognizing. So, and, you know, I guess coming back to notifications, for example, um, both from, uh, the menopausal and from from the Lyme, actually, I got uh, Babesia, which is a co-infection, which got into my brain. And so I started having a lot of brain fog. Um, so setting up notifications for myself to remember to take my medications, because all of a sudden, that was not something that I, was part of my life before, was taking medications and supplements. And um, I would just, you know, I would space out because I'd be sitting working on my computer and, you know, I'd roll out of bed in the morning and I'd maybe take my morning meds and, and then, you know, be cranking along, drinking my coffee, drinking my coffee. And next thing I know, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, but that's too late for me to take something that I'm supposed to take at noon. That's going to be stimulating. So then I end up missing the medication that day. And, you know, it's so using notifications, I think was actually really helpful for me in terms of getting into a routine there. Um, another thing was being able to uh, connect to community, support communities, uh, whether it's through forums or whether it's through Facebooks or whether it's through listening to podcasts, connecting with other people to um, to learn about different, uh, both local resources and other, you know, online resources, um, different types of foods and things that other people have found helpful, I think is also really important. And just to remove the isolation piece, because it's kind of disgustingly amazing how many people suffer suffer from it so it's it's sad and yet at the same time it's reassuring we're not alone um and then i think um gosh i mean there's just there's so many different things but i would say um you know in terms of tech and the and uh and hashimoto Oh, well, actually, one of the things that I've recently done, because I found that um, all of these things really aggravated some old injuries that I had, and it's sort of, you know, I just got all of this uh, internal swelling that caused a lot of problems for me. And so I, you know, used to be sort of an exerciseaholic. I was like six days a week, and I had to force myself to take a day off on that seventh day. Um, but I got out of that routine. And... Um, what I found was actually really helpful is recently I just signed up for an online workout program, you know, it was a beach bodies or whatever on demand. It doesn't really matter which program it is, but the point is I chose something that was 30 minutes a day that I could do when I roll out of bed just so that I did something each day. And that made me feel that boost boosted my sort of how I felt about myself, but it also has just made me feel so much better. Um, because, you know, our bodies are just in this major transition shift. So I think it was, you know, I could still go for a hike when I felt up for it, but it just has forced me to do a little something every day. Very cool. Love that. And there's something about even though indirectly, right, this is you checking in with this, but there still is a little connectivity and a sense of community. Like somebody's got your back and you have to check in and there's accountability. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Okay. Toughest question of the day. Are you ready? Sure. You're sitting down. <laughs> I, is, is there a question I should have asked you? Where to get my book? <laughs> well, okay. Yes. I was just going to ask that. Of course, where can listeners get your book? Sure. A little shameless self-promotion. No, my, my newest book actually just came out in print and I'm really excited about this book because um, my, my friends will laugh at me when I say it's finally for human, regular humans. Um, my, my previous book was far too academic and, you know, we all have our sort of learning, learning curve in our own ways and with our, uh, the way that we communicate. And um, 
this new book is really great. I think, you know, my, my mother was reading it and chuckling in the other room. And that to me was like the, the best stamp of approval. Like she gets it, you know, when my 78 year old mother can read it and actually not only, you know, understand it, but she was chuckling at some of the funny bits. Anyway, uh, sorry, somebody keeps on calling me. I thought I'd turn that off. Um, so it's they called, probably want the book. They want the book. Yeah. <laughs> so it's called Digital Self Mastery Across Generations, and it's available anywhere that online books are sold. Um, so, you know, I mean, you can go to Barnes and Nobles, you can go to Amazon, whatever your favorite online retailer is, and it actually any all, all across the world. So it's um, in international markets as well. Um, so I'm super excited about that. And, uh, and we're also launching our new season for um, Evolving Digital Self, which is the podcast. And actually, our Christmas episode is with Santa Claus. Oh, uh, how nice. Yeah, I'm intervie- I interviewed the Coca-Cola Santa for uh, the Christmas episode. So it's super fun. That is awesome. I love it. So listeners, if you're walking, jogging, lifting weights, or you're commuting, I've got you covered. We've got the links to all things said right here. And Heidi, thanks so much for joining us. I mean, this is such a, a an important topic today. We're not going to get away from it. If anything, it's going to grow. You're going to be a busy woman. <laughs> Well, I'm okay with being busy as long as I find balance. So it's good. (laughs) Phenomenal. Listeners, if you've got a question that I failed to answer, go ahead and leave it below the show link at flipping50.com forward slash digital. I love hearing from you. And if this episode was helpful, please leave us a rating in iTunes. It really helps us spread the word about Flipping 50 together and then share it with a friend so you can surround yourself with a supportive community of women on the same journey. To get the most from this week's episode, check out today's show notes. Again, that's flipping50.com forward slash digital, where you'll find all the juicy downloads, the ways to connect with Heidi and the resources that we mentioned today. What are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 together.